Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to Vlog 259, Literacies. I'm so excited. Um, this is going to be part of a, a new trilogy and let me explain where we're going to go but let me explain where we started. This vlog, Literacy, comes via request from two of my favourite people in the universe, two of my PhD students that are about to finish this year. And as always, Alyssa Raiden and I were having a chat, and we're having a chat about literacies, information literacies, information scaffolding, and embedded literacies, also a bit of digital literacy work. And as always happens, we're having this chat, and Alyssa comes out with a great question, so what exactly is this literacy thing anyway? Alyssa, I'm answering that question for you today. And Aidan was increasingly interested in how the phrase digital literacies is used to convey some type of interface or relationship between a university and a workplace. So Aidan, you've got a deal. Our second vlog will be on digital literacies. Ooh. And then the truly magnificent Madeline, hello Madeline, who's submitting Madeline, I think it's in the next two months, isn't it? Terribly exciting. Came and had a chat with me and wanted to talk about how to embed images, how to embed sound files in her PhD, her digital doctorate, so that it could be examined in a way that was authentic and real and productive for the examiners. So she wanted me to talk about the relationship and how digital material moves in and out of a thesis for examiners. So I've called that project The Porous PhD and we'll finish this literacy trilogy there. Wow. So this is a, a fun topic but it's also circulating internationally. There are some big debates that we're going to activate. These are important words, important phrases, important debates for us to all have a chat about. And look, there's been a lot of stuff, particularly about digital literacies, in the last 20 years or so. Most universities have <laughs> digital literacies as part of their graduate attributes. And of course, when we go into those graduate attributes and scratch the surface of them just a little bit to see the content there, we see there's not actually much content under a digital literacy graduate attribute. Basically the capacity to find information online and interpret it. So that's basically information literacy with a bit of a Google twist on the side. So let's get inside these words. Let's go for it today. Let's get inside these words and these phrases that are thrown around in policy environments, in schools, in universities, in employment environments. What do they actually mean? And most importantly, how can they alter your thesis today and transform how it is examined tomorrow? Fantastic. So this suite is big. The word literacy is important. And to paraphrase and change <laughs> the great expression from the late, great Raymond Williams, literacy is one of the two or three most complex words in the language. So for Alyssa, let's hit this project. Let's look at literacy. What is it? Let's do this work. Now, literacy is the act of decoding the world. So as we move around our environment, our senses pick up information which we have to understand and interpret and analyze. So making sense, making meaning of this sensory stimulation is literacy. Put another way, we receive information from what we see, hear, touch, taste, feel. Now what do we do with that information? How do we place it into language? How do we evaluate it? Now that's literacy, the encoding and decoding of sensory material. Now, if that's all you need from a literacy debate, have a great week, have a cup of coffee, see you in a week's time, rock and roll. If you wanna get a little bit deeper in these conversations, you wanna hang with me for a little bit longer, let's do it. So what is interesting is how this really powerful and provocative definition of literacy has been reduced to reading and writing. So much easier in many ways to make educational policy, to test 
in educational policy, reading and writing. So to give you an example of how policy makers take these very beautiful and complicated ideas and render them relatively simple, I want to look at what is actually quite a great policy suite from Alberta in Canada. So Alberta Education works very strongly with literacy and they define it as, quote, the ability, confidence and willingness to engage with language, to acquire, construct and communicate meaning in all aspects of daily living, end of quote. Now, firstly, that is a great definition. I think Alberta education has one of the best literacy suites I've seen around the world. But you can see even the great policy suite is focused on language. Now, certainly there is some subtlety there. Literacy is not about competence. It is about confidence, the capacity to apply this literacy to daily life and use this literacy to acquire more literacy. Fantastic, nice, beautiful. Literacies begin in the family home. We learn about our bodies, we learn about how they gain information. Now, before words, babies cry to convey meaning. They move, they dance, they learn corporeal literacies through rhythm, and they gain olfactory and food literacies from what they smell and what they taste. So if you think about it, growing up is actually growing into literacies. Sadly, we disrespect the great knowledge system that we gain in the family home and focus on literacy with school age children in schools. So in school, we learn, or we don't learn, the rules of language. Now, if our students are lucky, they gain experience and perhaps expertise in a diversity of texts. Now, I've called that, of course, multimodality. For our long-term vlog friends, we've done a very early vlog on multimodality as a trope. But students in school can learn how to construct meaning and how to share that meaning through communication. So literacy is located in a hierarchy. Reading and writing are the valued skills in the empowered institutions in our culture. Now, digital literacies are gaining a bit of a groove thing, a bit of a movement, because they're valued in the workplace, supposedly. Again, an empowered institution. So actually, the literacies that are valued in schools and universities are the literacies that are taught in schools and universities. And that, of course, blocks out all the other literacies that have this incredibly empowering, intriguing and complex history. Now, some literacies are taught in formal institutions like schools and universities, and they are valued over others. The literacies that are taught in schools and universities have the credibility and the value. And we've got a, a couple of literacy modes that are moving into credibility, and they are media literacy and disciplinary literacy. There are national and international associations for media literacy education, and it's a great area, a great field. And really, it should never have had a credibility issue. Media literacy, look around the world, how can that not be important? Are you kidding me? The reason why media literacy was treated so disgracefully for the last 50 years is because a lot of its research was housed in media studies. And particularly in the United Kingdom, media studies as a discipline didn't have a lot of credibility. In fact, it was called a Mickey Mouse discipline. I wish I was joking. But as media literacy is so obviously the skill we require for citizenship, then it started to be reclaimed as valuable. Now, I've written a lot about media literacy over the last 20 years. So if this is something you're interested in, just put my name and media literacy into Google and some stuff will come up that'll help you into these debates. But basically, media literacy activates a few actions. The ability to access, analyse and evaluate, but also create acts of communication. 
the next generation of media literacy not only referred to the capacity to access and evaluate media, but make media. So part of media literacy is maker culture. Yes, to interpret and to analyse, but you learn by doing. So a lot of media literacy has that maker culture element, which I like a lot. You make media and you learn literacy through the making. Lovely. Now, disciplinary literacy is the big mover in higher education in the last five years. Now, I did an earlier vlog for Al Narell on disciplinary literacy. Did very well. Narell used disciplinary literacy throughout her thesis. Her examiners absolutely loved it. So as a phrase, it's useful because it involves the understanding of specific vocabularies, knowledges, methodologies, ontologies, epistemologies in particular disciplines and also how those disciplines are bounded, the parameters of those disciplines and how gatekeepers are involved in patrolling those boundaries. So for me, the most important literacy that I believe should be overtly taught and used in every discipline at every level of education is obviously information literacies. Now many of the literacies that I've talked about already in this vlog are actually, to be frank, information literacy in some form. Information literacies refer to the capacity of a human to learn the skill to learn. So information literacies are actually meta-literacies. We learn how to find information, how to decode it, how to evaluate it, and then move it into different purposes and different contexts with decency and integrity and respect. So if you think about it, this is what I'm asking of all of you. This is what research is, that you value the information in a particular context. So here's this research project conducted in this context. And then you take those ideas and you move them into your research project, noting the new context, but also noting, wow, uh, the with decency and respect, the context from which that information came. As you move it. So the sexiest of the literacy sisters <laughs> is critical literacies. Now five years ago I couldn't go into a meeting without some random person talking about the phrase critical literacies. It was actually on my meeting bingo card. I really do have a meeting bingo card. A bingo card with a series of phrases and I tick them off as somebody in the meeting uses them. And five years ago, invariably, in the first couple of minutes, someone had used critical literacies. Bang, thanks for playing. These days, post-COVID, the word that's on my bingo card is agile. Invariably, basically within the first 20 seconds of a meeting now, someone will go, we have to be agile. Agile, agile, and then we have to pivot too. I always love that. So we've got to be agile, then we've got to pivot. <laughs> but again, before agility and being pivotal <laughs> became important, it was critical literacies. Now, critical literacies is still a big phrase, but for me, and to be honest, I think we all know what's going on here. Critical literacies is basically critical thinking, and we've unplugged the word thinking, <laughs> and we've plugged in the word literacy. At its best, I think critical literacy is well nested in the teaching and learning bundle when it combines innovations in learning, critical thinking, and active inquiry. I'm not a huge fan of the active inquiry model, to be honest with you, but I understand it has value. So when all those elements come together, that's really critical literacy. So at its worst, critical literacy is really vague. So it asks students to read their research in depth, right? So it's like, you need to read deeply. That's critical literacy. What does that actually mean, right? And that's why for me, the better definition is information literacy, which actually has the granular information about how to scaffold literacies, how to enact 
deep learning. What does that mean? How do you read with clarity and with succinctness and care? There are strategies to do that and those strategies are located in information literacy. Now there are some emerging phrases in literacy that are useful and we can watch them. Recreational literacies is one of them. Now I've had a tendency to use the phrase corporeal literacies in this space but Recreational literacies involves the cultivating of the habits, the interests in independent non-work activities. Now how interesting is that, right, in a time when work is taking over the world, recreational literacies is the phrase to watch, very interested. So in more movement oriented practices, so in dance studies, in sports studies, but also can I say in physical cultural studies, we tend to use corporeal literacies, learning how our bodies move in space, and I think that's a really intriguing phrase to watch as well. I'm also absolutely fascinated, I'm committed deeply, in fact if I was 20 I would dedicate my life to this phrase, but a really big area is what's called emergent literacy, emergent literacy. Now emergent literacy explores a person, most frequently a child, and their knowledge of reading and writing before they learn to read and write words. Now I love every part of this literacy theory because it acknowledges from birth that all humans are learning literacies. And huge literacy work has been created by parents, caregivers, educators before, before that first pencil is held and that intense finger work when a person writes that first letter. Before that first letter is written, literacy work has occurred, emergent literacy work. So this is big, it's important, and it includes great tropes like, I, I love this stuff, um, print motivation, print motivation, enjoying books, even if words cannot be read or pictures decoded, print motivation, vocabulary development, recognizing print before one can understand the words the words can be followed on a page skills in storytelling in narrative telling someone what happened putting events in order letter knowledge seeing the shape of a letter and recognizing that another letter has a different shape and the ability then to look around the world and see those shapes repeated. And of course, phonological awareness, the capacity to hear individual sounds and start to put them into words. K, A, T, cat. So why emergent literacies are so important is that we realize that actually emergent literacies, this is a model for learning in life because all new experiences require emergent literacies. They have to be explored. But it's amazing how often emergent literacies are understudied. They are hard to research because so much of our focus is on institutionalized learning of reading and of writing. We only define a person as literate if they can read and write. And as we see in the vlog this week, this is to narrow a definition of literacy anyway. And it blocks the very subtle and careful work that requires the scaffolding to what is called literacy. So children are not configured as literate because they don't have the skills that adults recognize. So we need to remember, I think, that all the literacies that we hold are based on forgetting how we learned them. <laughs> so if you think about it, do you remember we all learned how to drive a car? Do you remember those terrible, frightening like lessons that we would do and you'd hold the steering wheel in this particular way and you'd try and learn to back around a corner and all these weird skills and very nervous and a bit sweaty and... <laughs> right, so you're learning how to drive. Now think about some decades later how you drive now. You're listening to death metal, you've got a cup of coffee, and look, most days I cannot remember the drive home. 
Okay, I, I have no memory of the drive. I got home, I was in a car, but I wasn't necessarily conscious of the driving because we've forgotten the literacies that allowed us to learn how to drive because they've been embedded in our daily experiences. So what these emergent literacies do is offer a reminder that a singular valued output by an empowered organisation or person like a parent or a teacher means that we forget the just as important skills that have got us there. Okay, so I did want to finish this discussion with one of the great new research tropes that I found incredibly interesting in researching this vlog. And it comes from Barton, Lamu and Shaban's recent article titled Invisible Literacies are Literacies for the Future. So what these invisible literacies are and why they exist is these great researchers show the consequences of all of us narrowly defining literacy, of then testing <laughs> these narrowly defined literacies and benchmarking them and finding them lacking and having to test them more. <laughs> That's the contemporary school system. Picking very narrow things, making them hyper important, testing, 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 benchmarking, finding problems there and having to actually test even more. That's where, that's where we are now. So the only literacies that can really be tested are visual literacies. So that is the reading and the writing of text with its proxies of spelling, vocabulary, grammar, punctuation. Button, Lameau and Chabon explored literacies in Australia, in Canada and in France. And they were working around the phrase arts literacies interesting arts literacies so the arts literacies that they locate include design thinking yeah the production and the reception of signs and the translation from one sensory experience to another yeah and they argue because these literacies can't be tested they're invisible good argument Good argument. So in Australia, these arts-based literacies are pretty well completely invisible. In Canada, digital arts are starting to enliven this area. And in France, of course, the most mature rendering of it through ACE, art and cultural education. And ACE entwines the arts and education to develop cultural citizenship. So that's the project of citizenship. Now in France, the ACE project is used as a tool to reveal the hidden curriculum and to create an educational space of honesty and clarity for those who come from a socially, culturally or linguistically diverse background. At its most basic, think about the assessment practices we use in schools and universities today. Think about your experience of assessment in schools and universities. Pretty dreadful, eh? Lacking diversity, lacking really any innovation at all. So we all become literate in very, very basic assessment tools. The idea of really challenging students, working through interface management, multimodality, all that complicated assessment work is invisible in our universities. How many multiple choice tests and essays have you written in your university career? And compare that to how many artefacts you've created in your university career. Really innovative assessments. But can I say with great pride, think about what's happening in the PhD space. The PhD as a genre is diversifying in its modes, with the artefact and the exegesis thesis now moving through all disciplines. Now intriguingly, last year, when I was talking to very senior people in a university about the diversity of doctorates, the exciting space, the highest degree we give in our universities and how it is diversifying in its mode. And I was talking about the growth and the diversity of people in the PhD and the growth and the diversity 
of the mode of a PhD. Exciting. And when I finished that presentation, this very senior dean in an Australian university replied to my commentary about the artefact and exegesis doctorate with, quote, that sounds nice, but I don't know what it is. End of quote. Okay, so that's a really tragic statement on many levels, and we learn a lot about Australian higher education from that statement. Because firstly, she was not prepared to allow her ignorance to create a learning opportunity. So she didn't know, that's nice, not hugely bothered. So because she didn't know, she actually didn't care because it wasn't relevant to her. But secondly, that meant she remained wedded to a singular, and I would argue nostalgic, mode of a PhD research project. So she was not literate in the doctorate and used that lack of literacy to reinforce a very conservative notion about what a PhD actually is. So when we're thinking about these new modes of a doctorate, we're thinking through a diversity lens. Not only a diversity of research modes, but a diversity of people enacting those research modes. So as you can see, wow, literacy matters a lot, a lot. This is the new PhD for the new PhD student, a learner whose lab and library is the world. And Alyssa and Aidan, that's not a bad way to spend a career, eh? I wish you all love, light and peace. TL.